So hello everyone and thank you very much for resisting this late in the evening. And we have our last talk and we have Eme Liharo. Um, he works at Mozilla on the localization system and tool chain management and is going to have a talk on the road to int message format. Intel dot message format. Oh, yeah. the Intel dot message format. Yeah. I should have checked that. It's okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> So um, the last talk by Matyaj, was, if you were here, was a lot about where we are now, what we can provide now already in Pontoon and otherwise, how localization is now happening at Mozilla. What I'm going to be talking to you about is what's kind of coming up. What's, what are some of the next things in localization that we're working on and that we think are really quite important? And um, so, so, yeah, I've... Um, I'm on the same team with Matyaj, um, I'm a staff, a software engineer, but I've been doing this sort of stuff kind of for fun, for, for ages, it feels like now. For, turns out that when you get really into localization in, in JavaScript in particular, there aren't too many other people who are that into it, and then somehow you might end up hired by Mozilla to do the things you were doing for fun, for, for pay. So that's kind of nice. Hint, hint, you know, it's a good company. Um, I, in addition to, to working just on code at Mozilla, I spend a lot of time in a bunch of different standards bodies working on the standards uh, for localization in particular. And some of the work I'm presenting here is, the, is really the work that's going, going elsewhere than just at Mozilla because we want to have, we, we fundamentally want to make the world a better place, the internet a better place for everyone, not just Firefox users, but you know, Everyone's internet is better if they use Firefox, but you know, that's, you know. You're here, so you might have heard this one before. But yeah, on, on localization, uh, this is again covering a bit of what, what Matyaj was saying, that uh, quite often localization is one of those aspects of how do you really build a, uh, an application or a, or a site or, or anything that's, that comes up way too late. You end up making some choices early on and then you end up needing to live with those choices uh, later, and they might not be the best stuff, best ones. And, and it, the, the, the need for localization comes after you've made the choices, or you discover that, hey, this thing, oh, good grief, we need to support Arabic now. That'll be interesting. And a lot of the, the sort of scope of localization is interesting because there isn't necessarily one right answer. Uh, so, of course, we're working on a new right answer, and, you know, there's an XKCD comic on that. I don't have it on these slides, don't worry. But you know the one I'm talk talking about. So, things could definitely be better. So, we're trying to, to, to make some of this improvement happen. Uh, it should be easier to localize content, and th there should be a common way of, of doing this. Um, so that uh, the experience and you use, uh, the, the, the benefits that you get from using software and libraries in one place can map to elsewhere. Right now, there's a lot of differences in how localization de ends up depending on the formats you use and the tool chains you use and, and all of this. And that is not optimal. And, and fundamentally, a lot of actually, when you start getting deep into it, UI and UX design ends up being limited to some extent by the fact that most of localization work is working around strings rather than the complex structures like HTML allows us to represent and, and other aspects that make life more complicated. So we want to improve all of that. So let's start with this. This is nominally something simple. Hopefully most of you can read HTML to figure out that here we have this small little span that says that Brussels is the capital of Belgium. I've lived here, I know it's more complicated than that. So let's just go on. And, and Brussels here happens to be a link. So, so how do we make this localizable? How do we, no, how do we actually localize this in a way that works really in the end for everyone? And uh, one way that we're trying to sort of build towards is something a little bit like this, that you could add an identifier 
to the element there where you say that this is the Brussels message that we're really dealing with and include in the HTML something like what we have for CSS now where, where you say that here's this resource that's attached, that here's a link to a resource that's necessary for figuring out what's really the content of, of this page and then separately you have a message um, here in Finnish because you know I can and I could not pick between French and Flemish and because it gets complicated. I've lived here, I know. Brussel on Belgian pääkaupunki. Um, and, and here, the, the, the format that we're using, I'm going to get to that later, but there's a couple of interesting things here. In particular, the, the fact that we're marking up the, the, the Brussel uh, text there as the, the contents of a, uh, the text of a link, so that we'll be able to, to map that to the link, the A href that we have in the, in the source document there in English. And because it's, you know, of course, a little bit more complicated than this, uh, it happens to be a link to Wikipedia. So they, in this particular case, but not usually at all, we could allow the translator to say that, hang on, this link in Finnish should really go to the Finnish Wikipedia page on Brussels rather than the English one. And this is like, I can present to you, you can see the screen, you can kind of get what you're looking at here, but honestly, getting this to a state where you can get a translator who's not a developer to see this and understand what they're supposed to do and not screw it up and provide useful things, useful content in, in all the languages, well, the, the languages that this translator is working on, it gets kind of hard. So we're trying to, you know, make that a thing. And um, the, the, the rest of this presentation is really going to answer these three questions that I kind of would have hoped some of you would be asking, but you're not. It, they're really questions in my head I wish you would be asking. You might have as well. But this is, these are the questions of the, the, the theoretical guy in my head. Uh, might be asking, what's the format of this thing that we just saw? And is this really going to work like everywhere? And uh, how's this going to make my life better now? Or do I need to start using this whole new thing? And, and that's going to be a pain. So I don't want to do that. To, to tackle the first one, um, the, the answer ultimately to all of that is to standardize everything. And the, the first thing we're going to talk about standardizing is the message there itself. And, and one particular thing that some of you might have noticed is that it had curly braces around the text there, around the Brussel on Helsingin pääkaupunki, uh, sorry, Brussel on Belgian pääkaupunki. Uh, sorry, what's that? Uh, um, and this is because it turns out that when you're building a message formatting language like this, oh good grief, other corner cases. Oh, good grief, is it like hard, like proper hard, because you, you're trying to write a formatting language that developers understand, and then get the developers to write content in that language that translators understand without needing to have the developers necessarily understand how translators think. So you need to find an intermediate language for the communication to happen that explicitly limits and forces the communication to, to work in a way that works. And uh, this is one of the reasons why some parts of this work have been in, in the active standards body for like three years so far. But yeah, one reason for those curly braces there is that quite often um, messages get complicated because you need to vary different parts of them depending on different variables. In English, for instance, uh, it matters. Is it a he or a she or a they? who might have, you know, done the action here of sent an invite to a party. So we need to, to have a language message format too, which I'm presenting to you here, to, to, to enable this sort of a communication. And of course it gets more complicated than this. Because you can have stuff like, here we have um, a, a need to include something more in the message of, of uh, the relative time, like say, three days ago. Um, that, that's included here. So the language needs to allow for internal variables for this message to be definable in a way that translators can kind of see what's going on and hopefully not touch it too much because hopefully they don't need to do that, but still be able to do so if they really, really need to. So, so this is about the space of what's possible 
in most current, no, in some of the current message formatting languages. At least uh, Project Fluent, which we maintain and, and work with, and maybe one or two others. But when it gets really more complicated than that, this, is, this gets on the edges of not really even supported anywhere. Uh, when you have here, what we have are multiple different variables being defined, and then the matching on which of these messages really the, the message we're building, it depends on how many people as well as the uh, gender of the host. So this isn't even a full listing of the whole uh, set of possible when cases that could be selected here. But this is all possible. In, it quite often happens when you really want to formulate a UX experience that is, uh, that is approaching natural language. And, and this is, again, referring to what I mentioned earlier. A lot of this stuff just isn't, is, is, is the choices that people are making now regarding message formatting, how do they formulate it, are driven by the limitations of the technologies that we have available for us. So UX itself is being driven in certain directions because message formatting is hard. And you don't end up really having messages like this in your UI if you care about localization because whoever's you know, filtering your messages before they go to the, the translators, the localizers, is gonna tell you, yeah, no, you can't do that. They're not gonna ever be able to work with it. So please fix. And then you end up even maybe building the UI differently in order to accommodate these needs. With message format two, which this is, I, uh, I kind of hope we can get beyond that. Have the possibility and the options of having even richer content in, the, in, in everything that we're working with. But um, the second question there uh, was about, is this really gonna work everywhere? And yes, and we're doing that by, by trying to, to make much of the work happen at the lowest possible appropriate level for the work. So a lot of this is happening in the Unicode Consortium, and then we've got work going on in TC39 for JavaScript. Um, it's being added to, to, to the ICU libraries uh, provided by Unicode as well. And eventually, um, we're hoping to get, uh, probably in what we G, uh, discussions ongoing about the structure of, of the, the HTML stuff that I was showing you earlier, because that doesn't exist either yet. And uh, one particular part of this, I, I'm, my background is as a JavaScript developer, is that this is the first time we're really adding something to the JavaScript language itself at the level of like json.parse, where you have this string representation of a thing that's not JavaScript, and uh, you, you get an object or a thing out of it. I think that's really cool, but we're still working on that. And the, the uh, part here that makes this extra interesting is that we're not just talking about a new syntax, but effectively through the work we've been doing, it's looking an awful lot like everything in every single message formatting language that currently exists and is in use somewhere that is, you know, we, that we can know about that is not like closed and proprietary is supported in the data model that we end up with for message format two. So for example, to answer the earlier talks questions about how do you get support for something like Fluent into uh, software like uh, Translate Toolkit, one quite probable answer for the general case of this is that what you'll be able to do is take messages that you have in, in dot properties files, fluent, get text, xlif, pretty much anything, and parse that into a defined data model structure for message format two, then be able to work with that using tools, runtime, whatever, and possibly from there get it out in a different format altogether that's then supported by, by other tooling. So it, it's a lot of this work is trying to figure out that, hang on, messages aren't really all that complicated as data structures in the end. Or we can at least uh, express the level of their complexity. So we should ab enable
hello again. So yeah, um, I think I was about done with this slide. And going on, um, one, one key part here is that all of this is already real. So the, 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 what I showed you in HTML is not exactly what we use internally at Mozilla, but it's effectively the same as how Firefox is now already translated. We have by now literal years of experience of working with tooling like this and seeing how it empowers UI UX development of a relatively complicated piece of software like Firefox to, to improve itself and uh, to enable easier and better communication between developers and translators. And so, so we're bringing a lot of that knowledge and experience into what we're doing w in uh, the Unicode Consortium on, when designing Message Format 2, which is, yes, taking inspiration, but also uh, learnings from Fluent and many other systems that uh, make it, honestly, a better, better than Fluent currently is, for instance which is why we're not pitching that as the really cool, sexy thing. Even though, I mean, if you're interested, it is the currently coolest thing around that's real. This is still in progress. Uh, so, you, you know, you could be interested in that. Um, the, as I mentioned, the, the syntax itself for messages is getting uh, defined uh, under the Unicode Common Language Data Repository Technical Committee. There's a working, it gets complicated in these things. And uh, there's an implementation available in ICU 72 for Java. Um, and uh, the JavaScript proposals, uh, there's two of them at stage one currently for this, are progressing in TC39, which is the, the, the body that defines JavaScript effectively. And there's a polyfill package for, for JavaScript if you want to start playing around with what message format 2 looks like and how you can work with it. Um, but yeah, all of this is, of course, completely public. Um, the, uh, all of the repositories, all of the work standards are being developed completely in the open. And um, I mean, honestly, localization is one of those weird places where we don't need to filter anyone on credentials for like anything. Because in, in terms of who wants to actually participate in the standards actions and uh, standards work, it's enough that you show up and you show some level of interest and we let you in, in all the like inside clubs and, and because there aren't any. Um, the, the, it, it's, it's a community where really you can, if you're interested, you should not be afraid of, of someone saying, no, you don't belong here because you do. We, we need always more people participating. Um, yeah, there's links to me as well. Uh, and also, this talk is available at the URL there at the bottom. It's also attached to the uh, talk on Pentabarf. Um, but yeah, that was me. Is there any questions? Are there any questions? Mike and I'll repeat the question. The question is, or was, what really makes message format 2 better than uh, Fluent? And one particular example is, is when you get to complicated stuff like this um, is having the effectively enforcing the data structure that you get end up c getting from this to be one that contains full messages that you end up representing to uh, translators. The uh, other than this, it gets into really nitty gritty details. Uh, the 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 other big benefit of of Message format 2 over Fluent is that mes uh, Message format 2 
is becoming a, a Unicode, a standard, rather than effectively a project built entirely from within Mozilla. So, so the question here is about seeing the, the so, sort of typing that you see, the, the, the colon number and the colon relative time, and uh, actually the colon gender is the same sort of thing here. What are those, and are these custom or centrally defined? And the answer is kind of yes and no, and it's complicated. <laughs> because what you're looking at here are effectively functions that act a little bit like types, but they're not exactly like types. They're declaring, for example, that the count that we're getting, let's handle it as a number, but also let's, in the value of it that we end up assigning to count other, use an offset of one. So it's an operation happening on the input argument count. And on the third line in the match uh, for the host's gender, we could imagine host being some complicated object that's defining a, a whole person, and we're picking the gender information from that more complex uh, thing. But yes, in many cases, they work kind of like types. In Fluent, uh, these are the capital uh, number, capital date time, and capital uh, platform functions that can be used in this sort of way as well. Just be loud, I'll repeat your question. So if I've understood the question is what happens when the when you come from a when you have a complicated thing like a whole page that you're translating and in comparing the source locale and the target locale the target locale ends up having very different structure that might you know be go much deeper I suppose than than just the simple link that I'm showing in this example of how does this really work the, the answer is, uh, it's complicated and it depends on your use case. Um, this work in particular is, is um, trying to, to, to build tools that could enable that sort of representation within message format too. Uh, so you could end up somewhere really complicated, but you probably don't wanna. You, you're probably in that sort of a situation needing to uh, build more tools that are more specific to the use case that you have. When you have, when you need to reformat a whole page in order to do work with a specific locale, it's, uh, there is no universal answer to this. This is the closest thing, but I don't know where it's really gonna go. We have a question in the live stream. Uh, translators often are not programmers. They already struggle when translating strings with HTML tags and other technical terms. The message format curly braces syntax might be difficult to understand and error prone. Um, so here we're talking about something, l let's take this example of, of, if you put this in front of a translator, yeah, you don't. This is not really what we want to do. What we want to do is, is create a format that enables a, like HTML, a representation of something like a message in a way that is relatively readable, but is not necessarily uh, 
easy to, to edit and modify for someone who doesn't exactly know what they're dealing with. A little bit like um, what happens if you take JSON and put it into a Word document and then you start editing it and then you have to figure out that, oh, there's a curly uh, quote somewhere that ended up screwing. This sort of thing can happen entirely well when you end up dealing with complicated messages like this. So the answer here is that you end up using tooling that gets this to not be presented as one thing to a translator, but three, uh, yeah, in this case, uh, three or more different messages where you end up uh, at asking a translator wants to, to translate name invited you to her party on relative date. And, and then a second to, to ask them to translate name invited you to his party on relative date. And in, in Finnish, allow a translator, because Finnish doesn't, he and she translated the same word. So in Finnish, the equivalent of this message would end up being effectively just a third case without the whole matching because the structure of the language works differently. So you do end up, when working with messages of this level of complexity, effectively needing to rely on tooling. But the wonderful thing about message format too is that we can transform this representation of this message into any other representation of this message that's hopefully gonna work with whatever tooling is then available for the actual translation work to happen in. So XLIF2, for instance, or, or other targets that are commonly supported by uh, software used uh, for translation, or some really simple representation uh, that can be mapped then back to this, but, but still allows a translator to just see a simpler thing at once rather than a really complicated thing. I think there's more questions, but are we out of time? Two minutes. Uh, guy in front, yellow. Okay, so my question is, I can hear um, that uh, you are targeting uh, uh, the new message format as a successor of all previous attempts at message format. Uh, technically, it, it is relatively easy to, 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 to make sure that everything representable in previous message format is representable with the new one. How are you solving the, the problem that you are really encompassing all the different languages in the world? Because like all the examples we saw were in English, perhaps some of that, uh, some of the others might be in like French or another in the Euro European language. Uh, the, the, the case in here is just for female or male, they're uh, uh, languages with much more complicated uh, uh, noun systems. Um, in some languages, you might be uh, uh, writing a single message in several uh, um, uh, writing systems. So um, how do you make sure that the new uh, um, uh, message format encompasses all these different uh, strange cases for localization? If I understand the question right, you're asking, how do we make sure that this isn't really what seems to work for English and a couple of languages around English, but hopefully all the languages? Or a sizable number of languages. Or a sizable number of languages. Um, the short answer here is that uh, with Fluent, we've already, we're already doing exactly this, using a representation of messages that is very close to this. So for, ex for instance, at Mozilla, from this experience, we can say that uh, the simpler than this structure that we have for Fluent ends up working in all of the languages that we need to deal with uh, uh, through Fluent, which is about 100 for Firefox, 200 overall, for the whole pro all of the different uh, projects that we are currently translating. Uh, separately from this, um, the, the work being done for Message Format 2 is by no means uh, done really from uh, an English language point of view. Uh, of the main contributors currently working on the specification, um, my background is Finnish. Uh, there's a Polish guy, and then there's a Romanian, and then there's a Sri Lankan, 
and there's a couple of others who are on the periphery of this who are from a much wider variety of backgrounds than this. So we are bringing and ensuring that these sorts of uh, considerations are actively being remembered to, to be taken care of. Um, so to some extent we are relying on the expertise that we have, to some extent we are relying on the experience we have with working with similar formats than what we're presenting here. But also we're trying to build a, form, a, a core specification for message formatting that is um, sufficiently small but modular and powerful to then enable the support later on that is required by human languages. We're trying to limit you know, to just being able to support human languages, but it might go a little bit beyond that too. I think we're at time. Um, I'm very happy to have people come and ask me questions after. Thank you. <laughs>